Welcome, welcome, welcome to St. Stephen's Church in Burke, Virginia. If you are part of the live stream this morning or you are watching this as part of an archive or you are here in the sanctuary, thank you so much for being part of worship at St. Stephen's. If you are a guest, we especially want to thank you for the gift of your presence and we hope this service will be a great blessing to each and every one of you. We want you to get connected to the life in the ministry of St. Stephen's. So please check out our website, uh, find us on our weekly email, sign up for weekly emails, uh, find us on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. You were given a connect card if you are here in person, but there is also an opportunity to fill out a connect card online, uh, see in the uh, comments in the uh, live stream. But we ask that everyone would fill out a connect card. This is important so that we know who is here. And yes, we are making sure we're trying to figure out who is back and who is uh, part of the life in the ministry of St. Stephen's. So we ask that everyone would fill one of these out, please. You also will see information uh, about Easter flower orders. We are two weeks away from uh, uh, Holy Week. We are three weeks away from Easter Sunday. So Easter flower orders are being taken until a week from tomorrow, uh, April the 1st. So please uh, sign up for Easter flowers. Our Easter offering supports UMCOR and UMCOR disaster relief in the United States. So if you are ready to make an Easter offering, just make sure you mark it Easter offering or UMCOR uh, just so that we know uh, what it goes to. Uh, Sign-ups are happening now for uh, adults and for our youth to go on the Appalachia Service Project or the uh, Jeremiah um, uh, project as well. And so we encourage you to, to be looking at your summer schedules and, and speak with Pastor Forrest about each of these. Uh, and we want you to go and be part of uh, the life of mission here at St. Stephen's as we reach out. We know we're going to Kentucky at least uh, one, uh, one, uh, for one of the weeks, so please be part. Uh, also know that we are still taking donations uh, through tomorrow uh, for our college care packages. There's a cart back there in the uh, gathering place. Uh, so please uh, make your uh, college care package donations uh, either today or tomorrow. We want to thank everyone that came out uh, yesterday and was part of uh, the service on the grounds. Thank you so much for all that you did to help clean up and and. Uh, I, I looks like uh, everybody had a lot of fun. Some trees came down and, you know, we, uh, the guys enjoyed playing with the chainsaws yesterday. So thank you so much uh, uh, to everyone. And now, Pastor Forrest, I invite you to open us with our opening prayer. The gift's not for you yet. Uh, let us pray, church. Almighty God, we acknowledge that you are in this place. May we be open to the movement of your spirit. Guide us as we listen to your words and as we lift up your holy name. Lord, in this place and as we leave this place, that we may be filled with grace. Amen. Uh, one second. Hey everybody, hi, I'm Pastor Forrest, um, you may know me, uh, and I'm here to talk to some of our, our kids today, you know, young and maybe not so young anymore if you still have a childlike heart. Uh, so I want to let you know um, that it's been a while, so I brought you a gift. Um, so yeah, you can have this gift, and you can see uh, everything that makes a good gift is in here. First off, we have chocolate, right? Um, we have, uh, this is, this is, up to your decision, but we have a homemade gift, okay? Uh, very special, and of course it has a card as well. Um, but uh, this, is, this gift is for you. I want you to have it, I want you to enjoy it. Um, and it's a, a beautiful thing, right? But I have a question for you. Do you think you did anything to deserve this gift? No. Yeah, that's the right answer. 
But it's still nice to get a gift when it's like not your birthday or uh, some big celebration, right? It's just on an average Sunday you get to have a, a nice gift. And what's really great to think about this is if we didn't deserve it, but you still get it, how does it make you feel? Maybe it makes you feel a little, a little good about yourself. Someone was thinking about you. Someone loves you enough to give you a gift out of what seems random. I want to let you know, this is a, this is a, a decent gift. Uh, but there is a gift that God gives, which is way, way better. I'm sure the card is also beautiful and written out and has the best stuff. But the best gift that God gives is what we call the gift of grace. And he's given this gift of grace to us out of love, to you, all of you, just as I offer this one present, but God offers many to you. And this gift of grace, friends, I want you to understand, is given to you every single day and is free. It is free to you just as this gift today is. You did nothing to deserve it, but is because God loves you so much that God is offering you this gift on today and your birthday and every other day. There's a gift that God wants to give you. But I want us to recognize something, my friends. What do we do when we get a gift? You give thanks. You give thanks. And you open the gift and you use the gift and you play with the toys. Right? But then what if someone asks you, if they could play with the gift that you'd been given. Do you share? Should we? Yes, is the answer. Do we always? No. But with the gift that God gives us, it is a gift that is not just for ourselves, but for others. So I would encourage us all today that when we receive the gift, when we receive love from God or a gift from other, to share. And to take that gift that we've been given, let's just call it love, and let's call it grace. And to share it with your friends, and your family members, and even strangers. Let's share our gift that we have been given. So friends, I'm going to invite you to pray with me in our echo prayer. So please, if you'll put your hands together and repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the presence of grace and love. Let us see your love and give gifts of love and grace to others. Amen. Amen, indeed. My friends, I invite you now to please stand as you are able as we continue our worship and song.
We have two scripture readings this morning. One we may know not quite as well as the other. Our second reading is going to be from uh, the Gospel of Luke, a, a parable that we, we know very well, par the parable of the prodigal son. In 1986, the Dutch theologian and writer Henry Nouwen toured the city of St. Petersburg in Russia, and he visited the Heritage Museum where he saw a number of works of, of art. And one of those works of art was Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son. It's on the screen. It was painted some 300 plus years before uh, Nowen saw it. And Nowen reportedly stood in front of that painting for about two hours, and he watched it as the the sun shifted uh, in the hallway, and he was mesmerized by the changes that occur. And this is what he said about that. He says, there were as many paintings in the prodigal son as there were changes in the day. It's likely that you've heard the prodigal son maybe at least once, maybe many, many times. And when I begin to read there was a man who had two sons. Our, our first reaction just might be, heard it, I've heard it. But brothers and sisters, I ask that you would open hearts and open your minds and, and try to hear it as if you are hearing it for the first time. And so as we prepare our hearts and our minds to read God's word, let us pray, seeking God's illuminating grace. God of open doors, we often long to come home to you, to love, and to ourselves. But we aren't always sure how to get there. We know that we need you, but the road back to you is heavy with distractions. So if we dare to be so forward, we pray, reach into the cacophony of our hearts and minds and make yourself known. Quiet everything but your word for us today. Leave us awestruck. Drown out the distractions. Come as thunder or come as a still small voice. We don't care which. We just pray that you will come. Turn on the light, shine on us, speak through these words. Find the parts of us that are lost. With hope we pray. Amen. Our first reading comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, beginning in chapter 5, verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. 
For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then from the Gospel, Luke, in the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in desolate living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set out and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house... He heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, "My, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you. And I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf with him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you heard about the pastor who, after his death, found himself at the pearly gates of heaven? The pastor was just ready to walk right on in to heaven through the gates when St. Peter stopped him and told him that he needed a hundred points. A hundred points, the pastor said. That's a, a lot of points. So he began to think. Well, I was a minister for 47 years, the pastor announced proudly. That's nice, said Peter. That's one point. One point, that's all I get for 47 years of service, just one point. Yes, one point. That's correct. Well, I visited shut-ins every opportunity I got. One more point. 
I work with youth, and you know there's nothing more than important than working with our youth and our children. One point, replied Peter. I developed a number of recovery programs while in ministry. One more point. That's four points. You need 96 more points. And in a panic, the pastor cried out, Oh no, I feel so helpless, except by the grace of God, I haven't a chance. And St. Peter smiled and said, Grace of God, 96 points. Come on in. In the church, we talk a lot about grace. We talk a lot about grace, but do we really understand what it means for us and for others? The root of the word grace comes from the Greek word charis, which means gift. A true gift is something that comes with no strings attached. Despite what we have done or left undone, Grace is the way that we experience God's extraordinary love and forgiveness. God's grace is poured into our lives and there's nothing that we can do or have done to earn it. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus says, For by grace you have been saved and this is not your doing. doing. It's the gift of God not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Thanks be to God that there is no limit to the grace that we experience with God because God puts no limits on grace. Our lives can be big and full and messy and complicated and imperfect and a wreck, and God's grace still comes to us. Do you remember the name Art Linkletter? I bet you some of you do. He was a host of various television shows from the 1940s till the 1970s. I once waited on Art Linkletter at the Copper Kettle restaurant in in Aspen, Colorado, but that's another story. A reoccurring segment of his shows was Kids Say the Darndest Things. I bet you remember that. Maybe you've they're, they're, they're out there on YouTube. You can certainly uh, see them if you, if you don't know. One time, Linkletter interviewed a little girl about six or seven years old. And he asked her this question. He says, what does love look like? It's a great question, isn't it? What does love look like? And she answered this. She says, it's when I let Johnny get in front of me in line at the drinking fountain. Linkletter smiled and he says, well, you must love Johnny very, very much. And she responded, oh no, I don't even like him. Well, sisters and brothers, that's what grace looks like. It's unconditional, committed love in action. And today, Jesus tells us a parable of of prodigal grace. The word prodigal is commonly used to describe the son who who squanders his father's inheritance. And yet, this parable invites us to consider how God's grace is also prodigal. How it's extravagant and it's lavish and, yes, illogical. After wasting his resources, the younger son became destitute. And Jesus says that he came to himself. It's a turning point in the young son's life. He recognizes his loss. He comes to his senses. And he recognizes who and whose he is. And he says to himself... I will get up and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. And he gets up and in a metaphoric sense, he he comes from death to life. 
And what's the amazing thing? His father has been looking for him. And when he sees him far off, the father full to the brim with compassion, the father runs to his son and puts his arms around him and he kisses him. And he tells his servants, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. In her book, Saving Grace, author Kristen Power delves deeply into what grace is and what it is not. She writes, perhaps the greatest surprise about grace is that while our practice of it benefits other people and our communities, the greatest beneficiary of it will be us. Grace, she says, is first and foremost a matter of the heart. It's an orientation towards the world and other people that keeps us from going down the road of judgment and labeling, which in the end harms us more than anyone else. Franciscan priest and writer Richard Rohr, he calls grace the X factor. He says it knits families and friendships and communities back together after betrayal or hurt, or even violence. It's the father running down to embrace the prodigal son when he's starving and penniless and drenched in shame. It's for refusing to reduce people to the sum of their worst actions. True grace is otherworldly. It goes against every instinct that we have to seek revenge for wrongs or to shame and humiliate people who have acted immorally or unethically. It's what theologian Dorothy Sula, who grew up in, in uh, Germany during the Nazi regime, called borrowing the eyes of God. Borrowing the eyes of God. Thus, grace enables us to see the divinity in every person, no matter what they've done, what they believe, and yes, even who they voted for. Grace works the soil of our hearts so that peace, wholeness, and completeness can take root in our relationships and in our world as we seek to live an expansive life through the unmerited favor of God. In the Christian tradition, grace is what God gives us free of charge. But in a country like ours that values accomplishment and tells people that they can hustle and they can grind their way to worth and riches, or tells those that are, are having difficulty to just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, we may be more like the prodigal son's older brother, offended by the idea that other people would get something that they haven't earned. So practicing prodigal grace is not as easy as it sounds, is it? It really can be quite hard. Grace is something that we love to receive, but often it may be the very last thing that most of us want to offer. Instead, we offer others what the author Philip Yancey calls ungrace, withholding that which the world desperately needs. We may be like the prodigal older brother, jealous, and even furious about his undeserving younger brother receiving his father's affection and forgiveness. While our practice of grace benefits other peoples and our communities, again, the greatest beneficiary is you and me. 
grace is to live into the possibilities of what does not yet exist. That's what Yale theologian Dr. Willie James Jennings says. He says, grace means that you can actually look at the other person, recognizing that there's not only things that you don't like, but there are things that you hate. And still ask yourself, can I be open to the possibility that something can be created where there's nothing right now? Jesus' interactions with everyone in whom he came in contact with in his earthly ministry was all about new possibilities. But the tragedy of today's parable is that only one of the sons realizes the depth of God's grace and the depth of new possibilities. Because you see, the older brother refuses, he refuses to join the celebration. I wonder, do we have the spirit of celebration about us that the Father had? Do we rejoice in the love that Jesus has for all the world? When we seek to limit God's love and we refuse to share God's love with others, Jesus has a response for you and me. He says, but we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother or sister of yours was dead and has come to life. She was lost and has now been found. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? It's a call to celebration of prodigal grace. Extravagant, lavish, and yes, illogical. Let us pray. Lord God, help us. Help us to join the celebration, each one of us, of prodigal grace. Extravagant, lavish, illogical. Amen. Friends, I'm going to ask you to please stand as you are able as we join together in affirming our faith and responding to the words that God has spoken in our lives today. You can found it, find it either on the screen or in your bulletin. We believe in a God who waits in the driveway for us. We believe in a God who leaves the porch light on and throws a feast when we are found. We believe in a God who doesn't stop looking for us when we get lost. We believe in a God of prodigal grace, excessive, extravagant, over-the-top grace. In response to this grace, we hold tighter to each other. We remember that humans are not meant to go through life alone. So we look for ways to welcome each other in, to live like we are a family, and to lead with grace, excessive, extravagant, over-the-top grace. We believe that this is our call. Let it be so. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we have a ministry moment uh, from the Shepherd's Ministry. It is one of the Congregational Care Ministries of St. Stephen's Church. And it's uh, one of the ways that we reach out and we share the love of God. We share compassion and concern, and we help people get connected to the life in the ministry of St. Stephen. So uh, we encourage you to, to watch and to listen and even perhaps find out how might you will be, can be involved in the shepherd's ministry. It's coordinated by Lori Snyder and Carolyn Brewer. In the benediction a few weeks ago, 
Pastor Rob asked us to think about those who serve and who inspire us and for whom we are grateful. I thought of the Shepherd's Ministry volunteers. They are a very special group of people who make caring for others a priority. Congregational care is how we as members of the body of Christ share God's love by caring for one another. As the scripture from 1 Corinthians 12, 24 through 26 underscores, we want to make sure there is an ability to provide love and care and support to everyone in our St. Stephen's community, especially when they are going through stressful times. God has put the body together that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. One of St. Stephen's main congregational care ministries is the Shepherd's Ministry. The role of the Shepherd's Ministry is to help people in the St. Stephen's congregation stay in contact and feel God's love and support through acts of kindness, as Christ our Shepherd has taught us. Following our St. Stephen's mission statement, care team members receive, reflect, and relay the love of Christ in the world. Care team members send notes, cards, and emails, and have conversations with members of the congregation to connect them, listen, encourage, and offer support. St. Stephen's needs volunteers to serve on the care teams. Please consider volunteering with the St. Stephen's Shepherd's Ministry to help give care and compassion to our congregation. A big thank you to those who are already serving and to those who will consider serving on the St. Stephen's Shepherd's Ministry regional care teams. We'd like to use your Connect card this morning to uh, request additional information. Uh, please do so and place that in the offering plate when it's passed later in our service. Our Stephen Shepherd's Ministry is reorganizing into um, a more a larger team concept so that you will be working with others uh, and so we are so grateful for all those that have already uh, have uh, volunteered to be part of this this new reorganization and for those that will join soon thank you so let us uh, pray as we prepare to give of our tithes and our offerings this morning let us pray together Lord God, we give you thanks and praise for your amazing love and grace. And Lord, as we prepare to give, Lord, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to, to love you and to love others through our giving. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
to uh, invite the Armstrong family to come forward, who is going to lead us in the extinguishing of one of our Lenten candles. During this season of Lent, we are seeking to open our lives to God and the more expansive life that God seeks to give us. We can never earn an expansive life. Rather, we turn to God for the mercy and love to be changed. Today, we extinguish a candle on our Lent wreath because despite God's glorious plan for our lives, too often we turn from the light to pursue our own ways. We think we know best. We trust our limited knowledge. But God never gives up on us. The light that leads us home is always on. The good news is that no matter how many times we run or how far away we go, God is always ready with open arms to welcome us home. Thanks be to God for God's extravagant grace. stand and sing as we prepare to go out this week.
As we leave this time of worship together, go in the grace, the prodigal grace, extravagant, lavish, illogical. Go to share the grace of God with others. Amen. Oh, we'll see.